it's a major modern tragedy. We're losing our brightest minds, our most creative thinkers in our society. It's virtually impossible to distinguish between ADHD and giftedness and giftedness and LD and LD and creativity because characteristic traits are virtually identical. Without education about giftedness or the characteristic behaviors of gifted children, physicians, psychologists, and schools alike will continue to misdiagnose and incorrectly medicate our most intelligent youth. So we live in a very rapid-paced society where we want automatic answers to very complex problems. Diagnosing someone's educational and learning needs is not something to be taken lightly. One cannot go into a pediatrician's office, go through a quick checklist and determine that yes, you in fact have ADHD and yes, you in fact need a prescription. Guidelines for diagnosing ADD and ADHD that have been published by the American Academy of Pediatrics aren't being used by all doctors. There aren't any guidelines regarding giftedness or how to include the characteristics of giftedness in the diagnostic process. Studies have been done, though, that have shown that, uh, that in more than half the cases, those criteria are not being used to make the diagnosis. And so children are often being placed on medication after a single 10 or 15 minute visit. And that kind of practice is really just not acceptable. ADD is supposed to be a diagnosis of exclusion which means you're supposed to have looked at everything else but, and we're not doing that. It's far too easy to get a child diagnosed with an attention disorder these days. Sometimes it's uh, as little as going to the physician and uh, saying, I think my child has an attention disorder, and they leave with a prescription for medication. Giftedness is complex and by definition different from the norm. Too often, children who are different in any way, including ones who show gifted abilities, are labeled with a pathological condition, simply because they are either misunderstood or not like other children. Unfortunately, the view of what is normal and what is acceptable, particularly in the classroom, is, seems to be shrinking. And as a result of that, many, many children are, are being labeled with things such as attention disorders. I saw one child, a six-year-old boy who was very, very physically active, gifted kid, was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. And, um, and he did not have Tourette's. Even if he was making funny movements, they were under his control. They were not what you consider Tourette's or tics. There are lots of different kinds of gifted children. You can be gifted in many areas. You can be gifted verbally. You can be gifted in math. You can be gifted in terms of creativity or mechanically, being able to see how mechanics work, or you can be gifted in leadership. All of these we have under this big umbrella called gifted, and it doesn't do justice to the different kinds of gifted, nor does it do justice to the different levels of giftedness. Gifted children uh, have brains that work like flypaper. They attract every bit of information in their environment and they hold on to it. They tend to be distracted by a lot of things in their environment, but they differ from kids with primary attentional problems in that in spite of the distractibility, they're able to focus back on what it was that they were working on in the first place. In addition to symptom similarities, other conditions in the child's environment can lead to misdiagnosis. The one thing I hear most often with the highly gifted child, the profoundly gifted child, the word is alien. They really feel they came from somewhere else because everyone treats them so differently. Anytime you're put in an environment where you're alienated, you're rejected, you don't understand the people around you, it would be akin to having a normal child have to be in a classroom with um, 20 other kids who have Down syndrome. In that environment, kids develop behavior problems. In a classroom full of 40 children, teachers are being asked to do so much more. And if you have one child who's disruptive, you really don't have the time to go and attend to one child's crisis. There's so much accountability uh, with testing that uh, there 
frankly is quite a bit of pressure on both the children and the teacher to perform. Recess, for example, doesn't happen as much as it used to for, for many children, and so we now expect them to sit all day as opposed to sit for half a day, go to play for a little while. Kids, by nature, are active and need to let some of that energy off, and not having those opportunities as frequently uh, can create a kid who's fidgety and not uh, able to focus. Why aren't we looking at all options before diagnosing children? ADD has become sort of a I think a hope for people for a quick fix so that you can treat it like the dry cleaners. Like maybe it's ADD and you can drop the kid off, get Ritalin, pick them up, dry cleaning's done, kid's fine, no problem. Frequently the only option that parents feel like they have for diagnosis of their children is going through their regular family practitioner or pediatrician. Sometimes these doctors may not have the training or the time that it takes to really invest in doing a full workup on a child. Because a lot of times the, the primary physician is in a, in a tight spot. I mean, the, there's a lot of pressure. They get checklists from the teacher, checklists from the parents, you know, and it seems like the only answer is to put them on medications. Checklists give a lot, lot of false positive because a lot of the behaviors and emotions that children experience, they express in a way that looks like ADD. I think a lot of people, especially given uh, the sort of almighty dollar mentality of the world today, just don't want to spend the kind of money it require, that is required to really engage in a comprehensive diagnosis. So we end up misdiagnosing, and then we end up misserving. Many parents don't know that there are psychologists who have specific training in giftedness or learning disorders. Psychologists whose approaches to diagnosis and treatment often differ from the medical and academic communities. Why is this expertise important? I get particularly frustrated when a parent calls the office and says, uh, my teacher said that my child has an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's a very complex diagnosis and a complex diagnostic process that um, uh, is best left to those professionals who have the experience and expertise to handle that type of diagnostic process. When you put an ADD child on Ritalin, they're now labeled with a psychiatric diagnosis and they're identified within the school system as being a problem child and people stop looking for other answers. They don't look to see why is this child not paying attention. So they may be missing a learning disability or they may be missing that this child is in a class that is too slow, too, too unchallenging for this child. So the main problem with putting a child on Ritalin is it tends to be the end of the questioning instead of a part of the process of it. What happens when a gifted child is misdiagnosed and subsequently medicated or overmedicated? They can have, um, you know, uh, just a school failure. They can have severe emotional and, and social difficulties. And um, it, it can really be devastating, you know, and, and alter the course of a, of a child's life. I've seen kids who had measured IQs of 120, and by the time I saw them, they had an IQ of 85. And the main reason they had slowed cognitive processing is that they were medicated within an inch of their lives. This young man had enjoyed bird watching, and he stopped because he could no longer alphabetize and use his bird watching guides. I mean, to me, that is not a solution. We sometimes see these drugs leading to side effects that are then medicated by a second medicine, which are then medicated by a third medicine, which are then medicated by a fourth or even a fifth medicine. And not infrequently we'll see children come in on four or five medicines who are having such bad problems with motor control as a result of side effects that they're really just not able to function in school at all anymore. I'm the mother of a gifted child. We recently started her on Stratera after trying all the different stimulants because they weren't working. <laughs> One of them, the Concerta, they said, oh, we'll try Concerta. It's on time release. You don't have to remember anything. Well, I gave her the Concerta in the morning, told her what might happen. She was up for 48 hours. She did all her homework for a week and a day, <laughs> and then she slept for a day and a half afterwards. I said, nope, that's not going to work. When children are being misdiagnosed, this can lead to problems both at home and at school. Can these behavioral problems in the classroom develop into more serious challenges? 
We conducted a study between the Columbine incident and ending with the Santee incident in Southern California during that several year span. And what we found that more than 80% of the perpetrators were in fact gifted and talented students. So the lives of gifted kids are very complicated. Uh, we had a child who had been kicked out of school because he made a, a statement about killing another child. Now, you, see, you hear that and I say, oh my goodness. Well, these are Dungeon and Dragon players. These are kids where they reenact and act these things out where that's just commonplace. But in the aftermath of Columbine, with all the way that was puffed up to be uh, create hysteria about it, uh, this kid got expelled from school for making that comment. And uh, he came to our school, he graduated in two years, he was one of our top students of those two years. He's gone on, he's graduated from a fine college, he's now in graduate school. What we see in our practice is that there are kids that are able to maintain their self-esteem and their belief in their self to struggle through these problems. But what we wonder is how many other kids there are who are not able to maintain that belief in themselves. Uh, there's not such a glut of talent in the world that we can afford to waste the talent that these kids have to offer, and uh, that really is tragic. While misdiagnosis does occur, it is also important to know that some gifted children are twice exceptional, being both gifted and having a second or dual diagnosis, like a learning disability, ADHD, or Asperger's syndrome. My son Jack is gifted, but also has Asperger's syndrome. He has... Um, little ability um, to make friends, very few social skills. He has very limited interests. As I understand, Asperger's can't be medicated. There's no cure, so to speak. I have days where I'm really down thinking that um, he's not going to get better. <laughs> but. Given these important issues of misdiagnosis and dual diagnosis, what can parents do? A lot of people will give you diagnoses, a lot of people give you labels, tell you medications and tell you different solutions and, and it's a, a very difficult thing to be, uh, to be a parent. But you know, a lot of times you, know, you just need a little bit of quiet in your life, you just need to totally be behind your child and then you, you'll find your answers. Studies have shown that parental assessment of giftedness in the child is one of the most accurate factors in assessing giftedness in a child. If you think that your child is gifted, then they probably are. There is an alarming increase in the number of stories of gifted children who are misdiagnosed or overmedicated. Education about these children, their gifts, and the implications of giftedness is essential for doctors, psychologists, teachers, and parents alike. Without it, we will surely lose more children. We hear over and over from parents that this was a child that was uh, so always bubbly, always happy, always, always proud of themselves and the things that they were doing, and that that child has now completely vanished, that they don't see that child anymore. The ability to get that child uh, back again is one of the most important things. I understand that this all means more money, it means more time and it means more effort. But I have to believe that if we don't do this, we will regret it not only as a nation, but as a world in the future.